Gee, it's been good to be here all day. <laughs> uh, I got into the airport in Chicago at about five o'clock yesterday afternoon, uh, having traveled all day from New England because there were hours of delay. And when I got to O'Hare, I discovered that my flight up to Grand Rapids had been canceled. And I was beginning to think I would be spending the night near the airport. And about that time, I got a phone call from up here. Uh, one of the men, Peter, uh, who I, I'm going to mention these people without pa pa past names or second names, was within five minutes of the airport and uh, was ready to pick me up. And so we drove to Grand Rapids last night, and I thought there were angels all over the place. <laughs> I, I just would like to say thanks to six or seven people uh, that have made my visit a particularly good experience. But uh, if I named all the people that I've met, uh, that would take another 20 minutes. But uh, I'm very grateful for Jeff. Jeff, where are you? Thank you for those kind introductory remarks. And I love you too. I think it's just great to, to be with you today. Thank you for that. And uh, Bob and Chris, who gave messages this morning and this afternoon, I was totally stirred. Can't wait to go home and tell my wife, Gail, about those talks. and. Um, see if we can get a way to hear, for her to hear them. And uh, then I appreciate two women on the staff here, uh, Melanie and Amy, who have just gone way out of the way to make my arrangements compatible with the situation. And I thank them very, very much. And Peter, who picked me up at the airport with, within about five minutes of my getting off the plane. Uh, we had such a good drive up. And finally, my minder. Where's my minder? Tom? over here. He's making sure that I got my coffee and found the men's room and all in the important things of life. I chose a title that I'd like to see put on the screen, um, which is a little bit curious, but it comes out of some years. Uh, when, my, when I was a small boy, my father had one hobby alone. He was a very serious man and he filled his days with work, but there was one thing that could get him to lay aside his work, and that was railroad trains, whether they were model trains or real. And every once in a while, he would take me to a barnyard where there were trains operating and doing all kinds of things. And I got to watch these huge locomotives in those days uh, that were pushing cars around. It, it was really dazzling. If you take the train from New York City to Boston, even to today, just north of New Haven, there's a huge abandoned railroad yard that was full of life 50 years ago. And at one end, there's something that's called a turntable. And I realize that most young people have no idea what a turntable is because they miss the steam area. But the turntable was a huge, huge complex system that turned things around so that a cut engine going this way could and within a few feet go that way. And it was an amazing thing. And my father pointed out to me that at one end of the turntable, if you see the place where the engine is in the middle, um, a man would be there just pushing a couple of levers. And with a, a couple of levers, some steam would be released and this huge multi-tongue locomotive would be changed. And when it pulled off the turntable, it was going in a totally different direction. Even in my youthfulness, I knew there was a sermon illustration somewhere in that. <laughs> and there is of a sort, and it's often marked my thought over the years. Because this is what a man or a woman in Christian ministry does. We help people to change direction. And the turntable is the place of an experience where the turntable, where things go to work, and the next thing you know, that person who is going in this direction is going that direction. It's a phenomenal thing. And the Bible is full of case studies of that. My favorite is the one that comes in 1 Samuel chapter 3, where we get the story of Eli and his mentee, if you please, at the tabernacle in Israel. This is an abridgment of that text, and I'd like to read it just for a moment to get the biblical flavor of what I'd like to say to you this afternoon. The boy Samuel served God under Eli's direction. This was at a time when the revelation of God was rarely heard or seen. One night, Eli was sound asleep. It was well before dawn, and the sanctuary lights were still lit. Samuel was in bed in the temple of God where the chest of God rested. Suddenly, God called out 
Samuel, Samuel. The boy Samuel answered, yes, I'm here, and mistakenly to Eli saying, I heard you call, here I am. Eli said, I didn't call you, go back to bed. And so he did. God called again, Samuel, Samuel. Samuel got up and went to Eli, I heard you call, here I am. Again, Eli said, son, I didn't call you, go back to bed. This exchange occurred three times. It happened before Samuel knew God for himself. That's an interesting phrase, isn't it? Suddenly it dawned on Eli that God was calling the boy. So Eli instructed Samuel, go back and lie down. If the voice calls again, say, speak, Lord. I'm your servant, ready to listen. That's an interesting story, and it's romanced me ever since the days when I was a small boy. And I ask myself the question each time I brood on this story, what if Eli had not done his job? There would have been no Samuel. What if Samuel hadn't done his job? There'd be no Israel. There's something going on in this brief exchange, which not only changes the life of a young boy, but through him changes the life of an entire nation and the lives and, and life as it goes on in the gener generations and centuries that go past this. It's just one model of what happens when the turntable is at work. And I find it fascinating when I brood on this that God doesn't care a whole lot about Eli's past. Eli was a terrible father. He raised two monstrous sons. The whole country was feeling the bite of his personal corruption and lack of depth. And yet he's the one God uses to raise up one of the greatest prophets that Israel ever knew. What do we say to things like that? I moved from there to the thought, well, who are the Eli's in my life? When I was here two years ago at the gracious invitation of Ada, I talk about, talked about the principles of life that I had learned over the years until becoming an old man. This morning, I, this afternoon, I want to talk to you for a few moments about the people that dropped into my life over the years as God pushed the levers, if you please, of sovereignty. Men and women who, as I came into their world, said something, did something, tried something, and when they were left, the turntable had turned and something about me was new and certainly different. If all of us tried to track all the men and women over the years who have, who have challenged us in one way or the other toward change and conversion, we probably would come up with a list, of, and I'm just guessing, of hundreds of people. What if you try to narrow it down to 10 or 11? What if you say to yourself, I I'd like to try to just acknowledge those people who when they touch my life, lever me, left me never again the same. If you haven't done something like that, you probably will feel the urge to do it when you reach my age. When you reach your 70s and your 80s, you, you start trying to package up life. How did this all happen? How did I get here? Who were the people I met along the way? What were the high spots? What were the low spots? What were the joys? What were the disappointments? My wife, Gail, and I spent a lot of time in conversations at supper time about these kinds of things. So what I'm talking to you about this, af this afternoon is really the result of two or three years of, of thinking and calculating about the people who made the difference. For example, there's a woman in my life when I was a small boy who was a Sunday school teacher. Her name was Miss Cummins. She was there every week, 52 weeks a year teaching her Sunday school class, and I probably spent about three years under her teaching. Her specialty was the stories of the Bible, something I fear in the contemporary church in various places is being passed by and missed. You build a faith and a community at the bottom of it with the stories. And when I was age three, four, five, and six, Miss Cummins made sure that I knew all the major stories of the Bible. Our class just heard these stories over and over again. She had this way of, of, of telling you the story that just gripped you, far greater than television seems to be able to do. 
And not only did we hear the story, but we had to act it out. Three of my favorite, for example, were the stories of David with the slingshot and all the things that he did, and we acted that out. And then there was the story of Daniel alone in the lion's den, and my favorite, Jesus in the storm. And I got to act out. I was Jesus many times because I was the preacher's kid. There are a few benefits to being a preacher's kid, and that's one when you act out the stories in, in Sunday school class. And Miss Cummins would have us do this. And so here's Jesus in the boat, and the disciples, don't you care that we're dying here, that we're under great threat? And Jesus wakes up and slowly comes to the front of the boat, you know, and that's the way we would do it. And then there was those words that still the storm. How do you suppose Jesus spoke those words? Did he go, Peace, be still. Could have done that. Or maybe he said, peace, be still. Or maybe he said, peace, be still. Whatever way it was, it was a power that overcame the elements that were so threatening. And we would act those things out. Miss Cummins wanted us to put these stories at the bottom of our soul so they would be operational throughout our entire life. I suspect that Miss Cummins taught me more about the, the Bible than any professor I ever had in theological school. In those small years, or years when I was a small child, it was the stories that formed the platform of my faith. I'll say this again in a few moments, but I'm concerned as the Church of Jesus Christ comes out of pandemic, which I hope will be in the coming months and maybe toward the end of this year, we are going to have to rebuild whole congregations that disappeared over these two years. What are the first things you're going to give to people if they come to hear you or come under your spiritual leadership? What will you give them? Give them doctrine or all kinds of ideas and philosophies? Or might we need a revival in the next three or four years of people relearning the stories of the Bible? My faith is story-based. And whenever I ask my Self, the question of what does faith have to say about this choice or that choice, I always begin with what is the appropriate story in the Bible that speaks to whatever I want to know. Now, Miss Cummins didn't know everything. One day, she was teaching us about heaven, and uh, she said, heaven is a place of perfection. No sin there, no sin, no mistakes. Everything goes perfectly. I raised my hand. I said, Miss Cummins, will we play baseball in heaven? Well, that startled her, and she said, well, Gordon, I suppose we could. Jesus would like you to be happy, so if you want to play baseball, I'm sure he'll arrange it. I said, well, if we play baseball, that means that every time the pitcher throws the ball toward the plate, it will be a strike. But every time he throws the strike, the batter will hit that ball to be a home run. <laughs> but on its way over the fence, it seems to me, the center fielder will always catch the ball so he's out. <laughs> How does this work? <laughs> Miss Cummins was stunned, to say the least. <laughs> she finally said, Gordon, that's the silliest question I've heard here in a long time. I told that story a couple of years ago to a group of theologians, and one of them raised his hand and said, that wasn't a silly question, that was a brilliant question that showed a six-year-old thinking real theology. <laughs> to this day, Miss Cummins is part of the turntable in my life. I live a large part of the way I live today because of the stories she taught me in those first single-digit years of my life. The second person who was a turntable in my life came along in those years. She was my grandmother. She lived not far, and I often went to visit her. Grandmother was a deep, deep Christian in her time. In particular, she loved the Pauline epistles. She virtually had them all memorized. And when I went to her house for days, and I loved to do this for a lot of reasons, the first thing we did after breakfast was over, we, we would open the Bible, and we would read a whole Pauline epistle in the King James Version, no less. <laughs> and every paragraph, my grandmother would stop and she'd want me to read on as I was learning to read, and then she'd explain the paragraph. We would sit for two hours studying the book of Ephesians or the book of Colossians. 
I hated it. It was terrible. But I knew that when we were over, that we would get to go to New York City in the afternoon and see all kinds of fun things, and so it was worth it to pay the price of the Bible study. <laughs> My grandfather was the president of a missionary organization that sent missions, missionaries to Eastern, Eastern Europe in the 1920s, the 1930s. Uh, they almost all disappeared during World War II and then picked up again when the war was over. So one of the things my grandmother would do when the Bible study was over is she would say, uh, now we need to pray. So we would pray and she would say, Gordon, I want you to pray for the cities of Germany that are at war. There are children whose homes have been burnt. There are children who've lost their mothers and fathers. There's children who have no food to eat. So as we pray today, let's pray for the cities of Germany and the children. Let's pray for Dresden and Frankfurt and Hanover and Stuttgart and all these other places that were being bombed. And so as a five and six year old, I was learning how to pray for the world. It was a profound experience. I knew more about European geography than my school teacher knew. But when I went to Germany over the last many, many years to speak on occasion, and I'd be before a crowd I'd never met before, I would say to people, how many of you here are my age? And hands would go up all over the room. And I would say, I want you to know that when our countries were at war, I was praying for you. I was praying for your house. I was praying for your bread. I was praying that you'd find your mom and dad and that they'd be alive. It was one of the most interesting entrites to speaking to an audience I've ever experienced. As German people would weep, as the older generation would recall the fallout of the war and all the fires and the bombing of those times. And here's an American saying, when we were children, I prayed for you. My grandmother believed that a Christian ought to love the world. And so after the Bible study and after the missionary praying was over, we would pack a little lunch and we would go into Manhattan and spend the afternoon. She always had an itinerary plan. Today we're gonna to see the Empire State Building. Today we're gonna to walk through uh, Central Park. Today we're gonna to go down to the Brooklyn Battery and take the Staten Island Ferry over to Staten Island. I learned the whole city of Manhattan at the age of five and six. The subways, the bus lines, it was all there and grandma made sure that I knew it all. Interestingly enough, maybe 70 years later, I would be a pastor in central Manhattan. And you know what? When I got there 70 years later, Manhattan was virtually not a place changed at all. And I knew my way around from the very first day of being a pastor in Manhattan because of what grandma had taught me in my fifth and sixth year of life. My grandmother would say to me as we would walk through Manhattan, son, Look at the architecture in that building. Why did the architect design the building that way, do you think? Or look at this sculpture. Do you know anything about the man or the woman that the sculptor is honoring? If we went to, over to Staten Island as we pulled away and looked at the contour of the city, she would say, let's pray for New York. Let's pray for all the people who've come here from around the world to be rescued from uh, all of the ugly things that were happening. My grandmother insisted that as a boy who was on his way to being a Christian, that he would know the larger world in all of its beauty, in all of its evil, so that I could know where the calling of God would be someday. My grandfather was part of that too. And he would say to me at the age of five and six, son, if God ever calls you to preach the Bible someplace, go to New England, go to New York State, the lights of the gospel are going out all over the place in those areas. So many years later, as a graduate out of seminary, when the letter came inviting me to consider being the pastor of a church in New England, it didn't take long for me to decide. I heard my grandfather's voice at the age of five saying, go to New England. And I plan to die there someday. This is God's call. This is God's way of speaking as an Eli into the heart of a would-be Samuel. The third people person who changed the turntable of my life came in my teen years. He had a Jewish name because he was Jewish. He was my track coach in a Christian prep school. He had a wonderful understanding of athletic coaching. 
He not only wanted to turn out tra champion runners, but he wanted them to understand that the running discipline was an expression of one's Christian faith. So over and over again, I could hear him say as I got on the track with my spikes on, ready to run a time trial, he called me Gordy. Gordy, I want you to run for this such and such a time today. And I want you to remember that as you push yourself today, someday you'll push yourself doing other things. God would have you as an athlete learn the skills and the disciplines that you will need someday to serve him. I'd never learned about discipline before. And here was a man saying to me, part of the gospel is the management of life and making sure you're on focus. I remember one day running in what is known in the athletic world as the Penn Relays in Philadelphia. I was in lane number two. In lane number one was a record holder in the 100 meter dash who was there competing on the 400 meter track. As we got into the blocks and the judge got ready to raise the starter gun, he leaned over and he said to me, may the best man win. I'll be waiting for you at the finish line. <laughs> it's what you call trash talk. <laughs> the gun sounded and he shot out of his box around the first turn and the other seven runners, including me, thought, well, we're gonna compete for second place. But when we got to about the 150th meter in this run, I suddenly saw up in front of me this runner, barely jogging, now groaning in pain and exhaustion. I went around him and was Christian enough to wait for him at the finish line. <laughs> my coach stopped me when the race was over, put his hand on my shoulder, walked me off to a corner, and he said, Gordy, I want you to remember what you experienced today. It's a principle of life that Jesus would have you have. It makes no difference if you're a champion in the 100 meter dash, if the race is 400 meters long. And to this day, I hear that advice, I hear that counsel. We heard it this morning from one of the wonderful preachers, the whole notion of finishing, but finishing the distance with perseverance. And that was taught to me at the age of 15 or 16 by a man who was rolling the turntable and wanted to see me to learn new skills and new disciplines that would help me to grow to be a godly man. In my first year of the university, I met another turntable person. He was a man who offered me a room in his apartment. He lived near the university where I was in attendance. He, he was a godly man. He was committed to mentoring and to discipling young men. And he said to me, I have a room in my apartment if you would like to rent it during your college days, but I just want you to understand, if you come to live in my apartment, it's not just a bed and a room and a bathroom you're renting, but you're getting the kind of teaching that I think young men who want to walk with Jesus need to have. So I'm going to take the liberty over and over again to tell you when I think there's something you need to learn about being a godly young man, and that he did. He taught me a lot about Christian character. I'd been away from home since the age of 14. There was a lot of things I didn't know about being a gentleman. I can still hear him saying, Gordon, a godly man always puts the toilet seat down when he's through. <laughs> Gordon, a godly man pays his bills on time. Gordon, a godly man makes the bed when he gets up in the morning. Gordon, a man cleans off the table after he's finished eating dinner. On and on went these lessons, and they were the rebukes. You know, sometimes you're too defensive when you need to be a better listener. You need to be more thankful when people do things in response to what you want. You need to listen more carefully. He was also a model of what it means to have devotion with Jesus. Each morning, if I was up at 5.30, I would see him in the living room of this apartment on his knees with the open Bible before him on the couch. He'd read the scripture for the day. He brooded upon what it was that the Holy Spirit was saying. And now he was praying. It was beautiful to watch this man offering up these requests to God, and I began to realize, if I'm ever gonna be a spiritual leader to people, I'm gonna to have to do the same thing. He was a man who taught me the character 
of people who want to walk Christ. The next turntable mover in my life was a couple. Their names were Frank and Helen, and they lived down the block from the apartment that I rented during my university days. They were often out in the garden late in the afternoon when I came by, and I'd stop and talk to them, and I came to realize these people love Jesus. They have something to teach me. And one day, the wife of this couple said to me, why don't you come tomorrow night and have dinner with Frank and me? We'd love to have you. Well, if you're in college, as you know, you never say no to a home-cooked meal. So I went, and the food was served, and we began to eat. The food was unquestionably delicious and wonderful, but something I had not expected began to happen that was far more profound. It was the way these two people treated each other as a husband and a wife. It spoke to the issue in my own family life as a child growing up because my mother and father had never, as I know it, enjoyed a happy day in their marriage. They were conflicting from the day that they got married up in Pawtucket, Rhode Island. So I learned to live over the years of my childhood with constant conflict. I learned as I came home from school to look for my father's car in the driveway. If it was there, I knew there were going to be problems. If the driveway was empty, I rejoiced because it meant I could go into the home and have reasonable peace. So I had never seen a man and a woman share life together, to grow with each other in living together, to touch and affection. I'd never really seen it in any way. I'd never observed it in a way that it was important to me until now as a junior in college. I sit at the table with this couple in their early 50s. I listen to their conversation. They speak respectfully to each other. They speak thankfully about how they feel about one another. When one of them gets up to clear the table or to put food on the table, it's always interesting to watch as they cut their corners around the table so they can reach out and give the other one a love pat as they go by. I hear the affirmations constantly, the pet nicknames. I love you, I did this for you, I was thinking of you today. And I was awestruck at the way two human beings could connect and bring to each other the loving value that Jesus wants for us to treat, not only our marriage partner, but with our friends and the people in the neighborhood. I'd never seen this before. And when the evening was over, I was just dazzled. Couldn't get off my mind what I'd seen. They said, why don't you come back next week and have dinner with us? I said, in a heartbeat, and I was there the next week. Suddenly, sooner, I was there a couple of times, three, three times a week, and before long, I was taking dinner four or five times a week with them. All the time, not only enjoying the food, but watching two people who had learned over the years, because Jesus was in their life, how to treat each other as powerful, possible human beings, how they were growing because they were together. And I remember one night walking home saying to myself out loud, if I ever get married, I want to be a husband just like Frank. If I ever get married, I want a wife just like Helen. I want her to be my wife just like her. If I ever get married, I want a marriage that works just like theirs. And a year later, I met the Helen of my life, and that's 61 years ago. But I learned all that, and to this day, much of the way our marriage is conducted from my side of the fence in our home all goes back to someone who turned the turntable 60, 62, 63 years ago, so that I learned how you treat a member of the opposite gender with respect and love and appreciation. The next person I met on the turntable of life was a man who older people in the Christian community may remember. His name was Vernon C. Grounds. He was the president of my seminary in Denver. He was a man I'd met at the age of five when he came to visit our home one day. And I remember how special he treated me. I was just a child. I was used to adults saying children should be seen and not heard. But when I got to be with this man as a child, 
He always dignified me. He asked me questions that made sense on a childhood level. He would get down on the floor on occasion with me and play with me with the toys. He was always asking me about what I learned in school. As I got older, I spent more and more time with him each month in a mentoring conversation. When I met Gail and we decided to get married, his was the approval we most readily sought in terms of our compatibility and what we had to learn. When there came times when God's call came upon my shoulders to become the pastor of this church or the leader of this organization, it was always to Vernon Grounds that I turned. What do you think of this? Where would I face problems in this area? Do you think a man of my giftedness could do this kind of thing or should I back off of this? He always had an answer. He was always there to tell me what I needed to hear. He was the person who taught me about compassion, how to care for people, how to make sure that people felt dignified and served by the people who were walking with Christ around them. He was a lovely man, and I remember thinking to myself, if I get to choose the kind of man I want to be someday, I want to be just like him. And I hope to some extent people have seen that. Every once in a while, someone who knew him before he died and someone who knows me will come up and say, I heard you speak the other day, or I watched you talking to that person, and I thought I was looking at Vernon when you did that. You gesture the same way, your tone of voice is the same. And I thought, the turntable works. It works. The last person on my turntable is the only one of the eight or ten that I've told you about who's alive today. She's my wife, Gail. One night I came home to the apartment during college days and my apartment landlord, if you want to call him that, the, the one who taught me so much about character, he said a curious thing. He said, Gordon, I've met a woman that I think would make you a marvelous wife. <laughs> I said, tell me about her. He started describing her. She was this, she was that, she had this kind of a gift, she loved this, she was a deep Christian. He went on and on and on. She sounded like a combination of Elizabeth Taylor and uh, who, who, Betty Crocker and Mother Teresa. And, uh, <laughs> after 15 or 20 minutes of him telling me about her, saying she's a woman that would make you a great wife, I said, how soon can I meet her? He said, well, maybe we could have breakfast with her tomorrow morning. I said, Keith, it's 10 o'clock in the evening. You don't call a woman and invite her to breakfast at 7.30 the next morning. He said, watch. <laughs> and he went into the other room and he picked up the phone and he dialed and he came back about two minutes later and said, she's invited us to her apartment tomorrow morning. She's going to cook breakfast. And I couldn't believe this. I didn't know people could act this way. And we went the next morning. Within 30 minutes... I was in love. And you know, that's not a, 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 a crazy statement. One of the things that made me feel free to be attracted to this woman was the endorsement of the round table man, Keith, who had taught me so many other things. If he believed that the relationship could make it, then I would believe the relationship could make it. Four weeks after he introduced us, I give Gail a ring, and we were engaged to be married, and four months later, we were married. That's 62 years ago. I remember, I remember, excuse me, I, I was going in two different directions, but I remember about two weeks before we got married, my friend Keith invited me out to breakfast we sat at the table and we made our order and then he looked at me, leaned forward over the table and he took his finger and he began to shake it like this and he said, Gordon, I have something to say to you. The woman you're about to marry is a remarkable human being. God has given her an immense amount of wisdom and gift. And I want to tell you how important it is that you listen to her, that you listen to her that you listen to her because you're not a very good listener. <laughs> and he was right. I thought the whole world was desperate to hear every word I could speak. 
And here's my friend Keith telling me, there's a person out there that if you marry her, will have a lot more depth to say to you than maybe right now you're saying to her. To this day, I do my best to listen to Gail. And when I listen, I hear the most profound things. God has spoken to me in so many ways over the years through this woman who I wish were here today to meet all of you. Because a little bit, a little bit by little over the years, I learned to listen to her. I watch a lot of married couples in ministry over the years. Gail and I talk to a lot of couples from day after day. We watch a lot of couples that don't know how to listen to each other, particularly women who feel like their husband just doesn't want their advice or their counsel. And I observe a lot of men who waste one of the greatest things that God could ever gift as a gift, a partner who can tell us the things we desperately need to hear about how to grow and how to be more effective. I have never made a mistake listening to my wife, Gail. And I thank Keith, who years before had said, I met a woman who would make you a marvelous wife. Those are my turntable people. Those are the people who have made all the difference. I was wanted to make sure that I'd seen all of them. Uh, <laughs> let me conclude this by saying to you, I have a great concern about the structured church here in America as we come perhaps to the possibility of light at the end of the tunnel in the pandemic. I want to ask particularly younger pastors, what are your plans when you meet up with people who've been away from church for a while and are starting to slowly trickle back? When we get busier in the coming year or two, life will not be the same as it was before the pandemic began. Things are gonna change. Ways of doing ministry are gonna change. And we need plans that last perhaps four, six, seven or eight years into the future because a lot of people have forgotten over these last two years what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ in this larger world. I will say rather boldly, I think as we come out of this time, the most important ministry that men and women in, in pastorates across the, year, the years, across the country in churches, is not gonna be how good a preacher you are. That's fairly important. But it's gonna be how we train and disciple people on the turntable. And if we are mindful that there's a whole younger generation coming up who doesn't know the stories, that doesn't have the disciplines, that doesn't have the kind of people who will guide them to meet the kind of folks they'll spend life with or spend their years in life with. We don't have people who understand compassion unless they learn under our spiritual direction. I'm so thankful that there were people who met me on the turntable of life. And I'm thankful that as Gail and I go into our older years, we've been able to be some of those people who push the levers and send people in other directions. That's the way Jesus would have it and the kind of people we ought to be. Think about it and ask how God wants to use you to spin that turntable for many other people. Thank you very much.